Hey, today is a very special episode for me, actually. Um, I'm honored to be talking to Joe Hippensteel, a man who has dedicated his work and his life to training, stretching, and overall physical and mental work that's necessary for ultimate human performance, which is also the name of his business, but we'll get to that later. Joe is an expert in stretching and advanced physical and mental training methods. And I learned about Joe in 2020, uh, actually before I started this project of 39 Ideas for Life, um, when I read about him in David Goggins' book, Can't Hurt. And David Goggins, I think most of uh, the people uh, watching this, they might know of him or have heard of him, but he's a, a rather extreme person. He's done um, years of Navy SEAL training, three hell weeks, a whole string of ultra marathons and triathlons. And he has, for instance, the world record in pull-ups, I think 4,300 pull-ups in 17 hours. So this guy has been doing so much tension work and so much contraction that in the end, um, he actually found himself unable to be healed by regular doctors, normal healthcare, um, nothing worked for him. He had an enormous knot at the back of his head. And I, actually he learned about you, Joe, uh, through the training that he had during the SEALs in terms of uh, teaching of methods and also stretching methodology that you taught. And he actually called you and asked for help. And I think, I think that this is what he said. He actually, you saved his life by, by through the, the stretching and what happened. Um, basically, he was able to recover from all this extreme load that he put on his body. Um, this is just one example. I imagine that um, I've learned about some of your own examples through healing by means of stretching and also the mind work. But I imagine there are many more examples like this. Perhaps we'll hear more about this throughout our talk. Um, Joe, thanks so much for being here with me today. I'm really looking forward to pick your brain. Um, and I want to start with, with giving an example of how, because it was last week when, when, I, when I called you and I asked you about this interview. And actually it was at the time, it was on Wednesday when I was rather um, pushed for time and I was trying to complete my last post actually about doing an Ironman. And I was working um, the whole day and in the meantime, trying to schedule already something for the next uh, post, which was involving you and I was calling you and I was not, not clear on my time. I actually called you three times. And in, not only are you are you flexible in terms of your your physical abilities because you walk the talk, you do all the stretches that you teach. You also do them yourself, and you're able to do them fully. You're in you're, you're able to do the whole twenty four ranges of motion. But also on the phone with a stranger calling from Holland at the I don't know when what time it was for you, but at, at some time of day, three times, and he continued to be very very flexible and very helpful and and supportive, and and that was just. I think a great testimony of not only having this physical relaxation, but also a mental relaxation. And I'd like to continue on that later on in the questions, but I just wanna, wanted to address it. Yeah, appreciate yeah, it. Thanks again for yeah, being for, here. Thank you, Julius, for having me. Um, <clears throat> I, I appreciate that you've done your homework, you know what it is we're teaching, what we're doing, and uh, it's a pleasure and an honor to, to be with your, with your uh, podcast and with your show. Thank you. Joe, the, the first question, and I, I'd like to start with this question, actually, um, for, for me and, and for the listeners and viewers, can you share um, in, in maybe in a nutshell, your path, your personal path, what got you onto the path of stretching and, and in relation, obviously, to, to athletic performance, but also performance as, a, as an individual, um, and what led you to the business that you have now, Ultimate Human Performance? What's your story, basically? Okay, I'll give you a condensed version, obviously. Sure, yeah. Um, as a young athlete growing up, um, I had many opportunities to participate in sports. My parents were great that way, giving us the opportunity, um, having the choice between uh, doing sports or a job after school, we all chose sports. Yeah. <laughs> so um, it made for a, uh, my ability to be able to pursue what I like doing, which is sports. And I was in three sports, football, basketball, and track. Um, that led me to a very athletic uh, lifestyle. Uh, I was always having fun doing some type of sport or working out. And uh, when I, 
I did fairly well through high school as an average, maybe a little bit above average athlete, but I'm small. I'm mm -hmm. five foot eight. I was 155 pounds in, in uh, high school. When I went to college, I went to a smaller school so that I could continue to play football, hopefully, and track and field. Yeah. And I was just too small for basketball. So I tried football. It was pretty rough on me as a small guy because all the bigger guys from high school come to even the smaller colleges. And I was pretty small. I was getting banged around. Uh, separated my shoulder for the second time and mm -hmm. I thought well I've got to focus on track and field and my track coach at the small school uh, Gettysburg College didn't want me wasting my time with the other events I wanted to do the decathlon the all-around because yeah. I wasn't good enough in any one event so I thought with all-around skill maybe I can train hard enough and long enough to out train some of the some of the bigger guys and hopefully outperform them so that led me um, to I, I said I told my parents I'm going to transfer out to California and train for the Olympics yeah. So, uh, you know, kind of a huge pivot point in my life where, you know, you have to take the responsibility of, okay, this is, this is my dream. This is what I want to do. And, and, and then you got to go for it. And that's what I did. So I went out to Fresno state and did quite well there. Uh, I was the number seven decathlete when I got there and within two and a half years, I was number one, mm -hmm. I made it and they're a division one school. So it's the largest schools. Uh, and I was able to place all American top eight Americans. And I was the smallest guy ever to do that. And the most improved ever in the history of the sport. So mm -hmm. I just trained and trained and trained. So that set my path then for training for the Olympics. Yeah. My challenge was still though, how do I get to a world-class level? I was on a national class level. How do I get to a world-class level to be able to qualify for something as high as the Olympics? And again, yeah. the challenge was I'm small, I'm slow. I'm, I'm not that strong. So I had to set out on a path that would try and out train everyone outsmart yeah. everyone else and that led me to quite a few theories which we can get into yeah. if and when you want to today but the final theory was what i call my kangaroo theory where i finally figured out through through other theories that i did in training and spending years developing them i knew i had to have massively powerful legs so literally i could bound almost like a kangaroo so yeah. i called it kangaroo theory and that led me to i had to be massively strong which led to a lot of injuries in my career. I had over a hundred injuries, yeah. never wanted injections, never wanted surgery, even though some of them supposedly required it. I just said, no, I'm going to keep training and figure it out how to make yeah. my shoulder not hurt from all the throwing and my, my hips and my knees from all the jumping and all the throwing. So bottom line is I had to balance it with flexibility. And since no one's ever set a standard for flexibility, it was just a, a, a free for all, try and figure it out. And, and yeah. I finally started noticing that, what I call neutral points, where if I would stretch to a certain level, things would stop hurting. Like even though they told me I had a torn rotator cuff and torn labrum in my right shoulder from the shot put discus and javelin, the pain was there all the time. And yeah. I tried strength, I tried everything. I tried all the different therapies, acupuncture, yeah. um, everything except injections or surgery. And finally I figured out one day, I found a neutral point by stretching my arm up and back behind me when I got to the point where I was literally at 120 degrees, my yeah. shoulder stopped hurting. Yeah. Then I realized bicep tendonitis tightness there was the main thing, not rotator cuff tear or labrum, even though I have damage in the joint. Yeah. So I found these neutral points, like when they told me I tore my hamstring. I'm stretching, I'm doing massage there, I'm trying to strengthen it, I'm doing all kinds of therapies on it. But at night it would hurt so bad, I would have to massage the hamstring and stretch it to the point where it just felt like it was opening. So yeah. when I get my nose to my knee with my legs straight, it stopped hurting. It was like I pulled the kink out of the muscle yeah. here and in my hamstring. And so I started finding these neutral points, which developed then into a standard. Yeah. Then I found there's 24 ranges of motion. If you can do them, nothing hurts anymore. Yeah. All the medical labels go away, arthritis, bursitis, tendonitis, bulging discs, migraine, headaches, elbow, uh, you know, tennis elbow, javelin elbow, golfer's elbow, plantar fasciitis, restless leg syndrome. There's a hundred of them. It's yeah. all tension. Yeah. And when you do these 24 ranges of motion that we teach at ultimatehumanperformance.com is our website. And it neutralizes virtually all the tension. And these supposed diseases or syndromes just kind of like go away. Yeah. So that's my condensed answer. Yeah. Actually, I, I want to dive into that a little bit because... Um, yeah, I was I was familiar with the story during during my research, but what I want to emphasize is, is 
to, to, to bring this to light a little bit more, what you were doing at some point was you were squatting twice your body weight, which is a crazy thing to begin with. You, you were talking about these strong legs and building the foundation uh, with the legs. But not only were you squatting twice your body weight, you were doing 10 sets of 10 reps with, yeah. with twice your body weight, which is insane. I mean, <laughs> yeah, I, I can only begin to imagine what that, what that will feel like and how, how much work you put into that. Obviously, that is putting tension also into the body. Was that at that time when you discovered really the importance of stretching? What was that when, when the light switch was like, okay, the light went on for you? Quite a bit. Quite a bit, Julius. Yeah, a uh, good insight on your part. Um, in order for me to get this kangaroo build and this kangaroo strength in my lower body so, so yeah. I can literally carry my weight faster, stronger, et cetera, run faster, um, it took me years to get that strong. I was actually, I got to the point where I had so many injuries. I had torn labrum in my hip. I had uh, torn meniscus in my, my jumping leg, my left leg, uh, bulging disc to the point where one was herniated mm -hmm. because I, was, I just kept putting the load on to get heavy weight. Yeah. And yeah. most people would struggle to do one rep at twice their body weight. I just kept going until I could do three reps and then five reps, eventually 10 reps. Then I thought, well, I've got to do another set. And this took me years to get this strong, but eventually I was getting 10 sets of 10 at twice my body weight or 21 reps at twice my body weight. That's a lot of weight. It's a lot of reps. And my legs were really starting to fill in and become yeah. muscular. Yeah. And um, that's not how I'm naturally built. I'm naturally fairly thin. Yeah. And so I built this strength, but I realized in order, because of the injuries, I, like you said, I was building up tension and eventually I had to learn how to neutralize that tension. And that was through flexibility yeah. to a standard. And that's what we teach is to a standard step by step yeah. um, in a progression, uh, going through the building phase to get to the maintenance phase, et cetera, et cetera. There's 18 different criteria that I finally figured out uh, and 24 ranges of motion and yeah. about 50 rules. For example, when you stretch, you should never go past a seven in pain. Yeah. Why? Yeah. When you get to an eight, your brain says too much pain tells the muscles to contract and shut down. But if you go up to a six or a seven, your brain's going to say, well, that's not too bad. Let's adapt by stretching. That's the key. Mm -hmm. So that's the part of the program. Yeah. So, so about that, not going beyond the seven, for instance. Um, one thing that I started doing since Wednesday, uh, since our talk, and obviously I, I started looking into it, you mentioned bicep tendonitis. Yeah. Um, I have that on my right side. And I'll, I actually have a question about that later. But I, I started to, since Wednesday, I started on my bed, basically sitting down with, my bed is quite high, and sitting down with both my arms. And... Already now, in, the, in a matter of just a few days, my, my mobility and, and just a range of motion in my right shoulder, the left is no issue, but even with my swimming, it, I get comments on it from my coach, for instance, that this is more fixed, it's not as loose. And now in a few days, it, it had a huge effect already. So, but, but yeah. then coming back to, this, to the seven. I'm so, gonna ask my partner Mimi to step in for a minute to show <laughs> The people because the picture's worth a thousand words. So yes, please. Uh, yeah. Mimi's been my partner for 20 some years. She's been working with the Navy SEALs with me. Yeah. And um, I'm just gonna show you what kind of range of motion is normal with people yeah. and what you have to work towards. Now she's yeah. not stretched or warmed up, but come on over and. Okay, I'm gonna move to the side here. Mimi, this is Hi, Julius Mimi. and uh, hello nice to, to his uh, people who, who will eventually be watching hello, the video. Everyone. So Mimi um, was also, a, uh, I would say, a very non-talented runner when I met her doing distance running, and she fell in love with the mile and eventually became Masters track and field in her age group national champion six times wow. uh, because of the very, very hard training we do. And at first she resisted some of the flexibility work because she was working with some gold medal sprinters in the 96 Olympics as their massage therapist. And she went on to... Um, we kept discussing and doing some training together. The last event in the decathlon is 1500 meters, which is the metric mile. Mm -hmm. So she started training with me and eventually she became uh, the national champion. So a uh, great accomplishment for her. But I'm gonna show you the one range of motion. Uh, back up just right here and put your hands here. So normally people with their arms straight behind them and their, and their hands clasped yeah. or, or somewhere the average is between 30 and 60 degrees. If you ask a physiotherapist or a physical therapist, what should you be able to do with arm extension or shoulder extension? 
they would say, what do you mean? And I say, well, what do you mean? What do I mean? Uh, there <laughs> has to be a standard. They're like, well, there is no standard, but the average is 30 to 60 degrees. Yeah. 30 degrees here, 60 here. This is 90. Yeah. Where you need to be is 120. Yeah. Are you loose enough right now? Are you warmed up at all? She's not warmed up, so I'm not going to push it. Right there is like 100 degrees. There's 90. If yeah. you can imagine her hands up here, even with the top of her head, that's 120. Yeah. If you can't go to 120, you have bicep tendonitis. Guaranteed 100% of the time. Yeah, which is what I do. Yeah, I have that. Yeah, and, and everyone who uses their shoulders in any, over, over almost every sport is yeah. going to have that. That's the number one shoulder injury, not rotator cuff tear. Yeah. not labrum tear doctors don't know this the medical world doesn't know it athletic trainers don't know it i'm saying it because i've tested six thousand people yeah and everybody who can't go to 120 has bicep tendonitis so what we do then is we work on that stretch over and over in the building phase getting getting to that range of motion and then we go in and do trigger point on those bicep tendons or on the bicep muscle and so we the, can the take trigger, trigger point, point out. after the building phase we do trigger points during the building phase when we're building range of motion. It may take a few days, a few weeks, it may take mm -hmm. a few months even. Yeah. But as we do the stretches, when we go into the dead zone, which is a rest period between stretches, yes. we'll do a little bit of trigger points. So we'll use our thumbs, we'll use a tool sometimes. The physiotherapists think trigger point is a therapy by itself. It's not. Mm -hmm. It can relieve some tension, but it doesn't fix the problem. Mm -hmm. if, you're, if you have bicep tendonitis and you can't go to 120, it means your bicep's too short. You may have an an eight inch muscle that's only seven inches long now and it's like a frozen piece of meat it just doesn't expand yeah. unless you hold it for two minutes then you rest wait for blood flow and it's a little bit longer a little yeah. bit longer a little bit longer so we do trigger point in order to tamp down the tension between stretches even when we're stretching sometimes we'll press on those tight spots and they'll be sore but if you're doing trigger point without stretching then you're not accomplishing the problem you're only treating symptoms at best yeah so the, so the point of the, the, the trigger point is basically you, you press either with a thumb or with a, with, a, with, a, with, a, with a tool for it, and you press on those sore points. Right. But you do, but you do it after you've been, you've been engaged in the stretch. Either during the stretch or okay. after the stretch. Yeah. And, and again, that's something that takes a little bit of training to do it right. Sure. Uh, there's two bicep tendons, so we have to get each one. Yeah. Uh, we'll hold for a period of time uh, where we try and go from from an eight in pain down to a six in pain. Yeah. We can go up to an eight when we do trigger point because it's one spot you can take a little more, whereas stretching at seven because you're talking overall multiple joints, multiple muscles. Yeah. So seven is our limit for stretching, eight is our limit for trigger point, but we wait for the brain and the, and the proprioceptors of the client for them to give a chance to relax. Mm -hmm. um, a lot of physiotherapists will dig in and try and dig out the kink in the muscle. That's not how it works. Yeah. If you go to a point where you're limiting it to seven or eight and hold it, the brain's going to engage with the client and eventually it's going to just calm down. And then release. it goes down to a six and we go back to an eight. Yeah. It calms down to a six, we go back to an eight. So now we're melting it down. We go into stretch again. All of a sudden, the range of motion goes up higher. That's what we're How does someone who is starting with this and who's not familiar with these feelings and how it should feel, how do, does one know that you're at a seven or a six? It's the number one thing they have to learn. Yeah. Um, yeah. When, when their face starts to go from um, like being that. calm to yeah. uh, where they're starting to show a grimace, yeah. then we know they're crossing that borderline. And oh, okay. uh, if they get to an eight when they're stretching, we have to back them off. And sometimes it takes a few days or a few weeks for people to realize, yeah. oh, that's what you mean. Don't push too hard. Yeah. But a lot of the athletes we work with and Navy SEALs that we work with think, well, if a seven is good, the nine must be better. So the more pain, the better. That's not how stretching works. Yeah. Oh. Yeah, actually, I, I had that experience because my, my bed is it's like a box spring bed and it's rather high. What I did today yeah. is I got a yoga block and I put the yoga block and I was sitting on the yoga block with my arms on the bed. So I, I yes. was getting the pull from the bed and my body weight, obviously, yeah, it, it results in the stress, but it was better. It, what I did have, I had the, the, the grimace on it. I was like, ah, like that. So probably I was beyond yeah. seven. And yes. after with the block, it was, uh, it was a good experience. But yeah, it's, yes. it's really opening it up. I, I, I really noticed in just a matter of a few days. And I've been really having this problem for years. Yeah. And that's what we deal with every day. Yeah. Uh, all the different aches and pains people have in the musculoskeletal system almost all of them can disappear. All the labels that doctors put on you, they'll yeah. call it aging or they'll call it 
a syndrome or they'll call it a a disease and uh we can just make those melt away because it's it's all the common denominator is tension yes. eliminate the tension yeah. increase range of motion and you and you've solved the problem yeah so in in so simple terms what you're preaching and but you, what you're also proving through results in what i've experienced my own experience uh, now is that you're curing injuries through stretching and that you by trial and error actually discovered this and through a scientific approach you discovered kind of the right. system um with these standards which were absent in the in the medical world that's correct and and you know what it's interesting the medical world the people who are really advanced thinkers and the physiology world and the athletic trainers they know there's something missing yeah they know there's a reason there has to be a reason why all these injuries are occurring even though they have all these gadgets and all these different techniques and all these things that they're doing there's something missing a lot of them know that yeah and when they learn what we're doing they say that's it that's the missing link and that's what we're providing is a way to take control gradually build the body back to the ranges of motion that we all had when we were young when we were kids every kid yeah. can yeah. do all my ranges but yeah. adults can't why repetition yeah. lifestyle um overuse so yeah. when we when we slowly build it back up to a bigger range of motion People just don't hurt anymore. And it's miraculous. It really is. I think it's a great point that you mentioned that that mm -hmm. children, because these are not like we're, we're some hyper flexible person that we develop into. Actually, children can do this. They naturally right. can, can, they have these ranges of motion, but we limit them through indeed, like you say, repetitive movements and certain kind of habits and trainings and whatnot. And we're not doing the antagonist, which is obviously what the stretching provides for us. Right. Uh, uh, one yeah. thing that, that I want to dive into, you, you mentioned it, the, the pulled hamstring. When you were um, busy with qualifying for the Olympics, um, you actually pulled a hamstring. And um, as, as you were told, you, you even were advised to get surgery for it at the time. And you chose to, to go your own path. And this is where you developed, or you, you developed the stretching routine where at the point where you said when the nose was touching the knees, the pain was gone. And That's you right. mentioned that this is this is actually um, a muscle lock if, if i understand it correct and yes well you've done your homework that's awesome sorry <laughs> you've done your homework you you know that the, the lingo that we use the language yes yeah so, so yeah. can you tell me more about muscle lock and and how this relates to understanding our range of motion yes you're, you're really on top of it uh great work julius um what i discovered with that hamstring thing it was about uh, six weeks or two months before the Olympic trials in the United States. And I hadn't qualified yet. And I had a big meeting up and in practice, I was doing really well. My training was going well. And, uh, I had a hamstring injury on the track. I dropped to the ground. The coaches came over and said, Oh, it's torn. They can feel a gap in the muscle. Yeah. I'm like, Oh no, I just devoted several years of, of, of total dedication living in my car so I wouldn't have to pay rent. Um, I was traveling around different universities using different coaches. They say it's torn. I go to the doctor. They say, yeah, it's torn. I go to the physical therapist. They say, yeah, it's torn. So I thought, OK, I'm going to I'm not going to have surgery, obviously, right before the Olympic trials. I'm going to try and strengthen it. So yeah. I'm in the weight room. I'm, in, I'm doing hamstring curls. I'm, you know, pulling the, the, the weights up with my with my ankles, trying to strengthen it. And it kept feeling worse. I thought, something's, not, something's not right. So at night, what I would do is it would hurt so bad. I would just massage it you know, the, the lower part of my uh, left hamstring. Yeah. And it felt like the massage was helping. But when I did that, I could then feel like I could stretch it a little bit more. So I'm going lower and lower as I'm sitting on the ground with my legs straight. And as I massage it more and dig in more, I felt like I was kind of melting down the tension going further mm -hmm. down. Eventually I got my nose to my knee and it was gone. Yeah. And I said, wait a second, it, that, that can't be if it's torn. Yeah. It had to be locked up like a kink or a knot, well, they'll call it in, in, yeah. in the athletic world. Yeah. And I thought, what? Well, it's it feels more like it was locked and I unlocked it. So that's when I notice also when I'm doing the arm one up behind, I get to 120 and it unlocked everything. Yeah. So pain melted away. Uh, I didn't make make it to the Olympic trials because it was a little bit too late at that point. Yeah. But I learned something and now that's what I teach. Yeah. And it's an absolute breakthrough. Yeah. Uh, people are just getting relief from all kinds of these conditions, medical labels that yeah. that, that are put on them. Which in reality, as I imagine, are in most cases just simply locks of our muscle where we've become too tight by rep repetitive behavior 
and, and actually we need to relax and loosen it again. Exactly, yeah. exactly. If a muscle is not full length, yeah. if it's locked, if it's not full length, you have a problem. You have pain and it starts tugging on the tendons on your joints yeah. and they'll call it tendonitis, bursitis, arthritis, whatever. They start yeah. putting labels on it. And all it is, is you've got to lengthen the muscle. But since no one has ever developed a standard before, it's kind of like if I would take some of my Navy SEAL buddies out to, to go target shooting and we blindfold them, and we shoot in the dark and we say, okay, great job. Yeah. How do you know? There's no target. Yeah. <laughs> you have to, you have to gear towards something. You have yeah. to work towards something. It has to be a goal. Another thing um, about the type of stretching, if I understand correctly, um, the main focus is static stretches, right? Not dynamic stretches. Correct. Um, and you alternate this way, actually long um, static stretches, alternate by, by, uh, by one minute of dead zone, the, the resting, and two minutes of the, of the long static stretch. Um, mm -hmm. What are your thoughts on dynamic stretching, one and two? Why is this static stretching so important? Okay, great, great question. The whole athletic world has locked into do only dynamic stretches before your workout. I'm here to tell you the world's not flat anymore. It's round. Yeah. And when everybody used to think that the world was flat and they all knew it was flat, I'm telling you, that's the thinking that's going on right now with yeah. only dynamic stretches. Yeah. Got to lengthen the muscle to the full length before your workout. Now, obviously, if you're super tight and you haven't stretched for 14 years, it's going to take several weeks or months to get there. Yeah. Once you get there, though, you've got to keep that muscle open because workouts are going to make you tight. If, if you run a marathon, you're not going to be able to stretch real well right after the marathon. Yeah. But leading up to the marathon, if you're maintaining a full range of motion, not only are you keeping the length and the tension away, you're allowing the fibers to be more open to absorb more fuel that yeah. you can use in the marathon. Yeah. So, so when, when the trainers are teaching dynamic stretching only, what they're really saying is, is they don't understand that there has to be a goal, there has to be a target, uh, a standard for range of motion. And um, by, by only doing dynamic, there, every time you have a soreness from the day before, you're mm -hmm. gonna be just a little bit less stretched when you did the dynamic the next day. Right. Yeah. So if, if you do that for 177 days in a row or whatever, and you're getting a little bit shorter, a little bit shorter, a little bit yeah. shorter with your marathon training or with your weightlifting or your sport, you're never finishing the stretch. Yeah. So eventually that becomes a problem. It starts tugging on the joint, just like your shoulder. You feel the tension. Yes, swimming is good mo mobility, but mobility is all, another word they're using in place of flexibility. Hmm. Mobility means you can move through a certain range of motion, but if yeah. it's not a full range of motion, you're mobile in a limited range. Yeah. You have to have a full range to finish it. Yeah. That's what we teach. Yeah. Now, so, so that being said, you have to do some static as part of a four part warm up, hmm. when you're doing a workout, there's four parts to a, to a perfect warm up. If you want, I'll go into that. Yeah, please. I'd love to hear that. First, the first thing is to do some cardio to get your blood flowing. That's what yeah. people understand. The second thing you need to do is static stretching. The third thing is dynamic. The fourth thing is sport specific. Yeah. So let's say you're going to do a bench press workout. You've got to do some, if you do some cardio, you do some static stretching for the chest and shoulders, you do some dynamic swinging your arms, doing circles, whatever. Mm -hmm. Then you do some warm up sets. Same with running. If you're going to play soccer, you have to do some warm up sets, sport specific warm up, like mm -hmm. a 50 yard dash, you know, at 80%, then 90%, then 100%. The, there's two of those that are optional, and two of them are mandatory. You've got to do the static stretching, you've got to do the sport specific. Yeah. The cardio up front is not mandatory. And the dynamic is not mandatory. Yeah. You've got to do the static and the sport specific. I'm, I'm very eager to ask the question. Um, I think, and, and I speak for myself, uh, because I've, I've, I've known intuitively that I need to do more stretching because I do quite a lot of training and I, need, I, I know I need to do it. And I know also there are more people like me who don't want to do it or they, they, they don't think it's necessary or they don't believe in it or they're a little bit lazy or they just want to focus on doing that exercise that, that, that actually supposedly brings them to their, to their goal. What are me and those other people going to notice when we start doing those four points, when we start implementing that? That's a fantastic question. You're, you're so right on the money. The, the reason people don't do the stretching is because they don't know what to do. Yeah. There's a hundred opinions out there of how to stretch, even yoga which has been around for thousands of years. Yeah. 
but they still don't have it right yet. In yoga, for example, they think more is better. If you can put your foot behind your head when you're sitting on the ground, that's good. Yeah. All that does is loosen your ligaments too much. The only people that enjoy yoga are the 20% of the population that have a good genetic gift of flexibility. The mm -hmm. other 80%, it doesn't work for. People get hurt doing yeah. it. I have yoga teachers that come to me where I have to fix their back because they don't understand stretching to a standard. Yeah. So, so to answer your question, what people are missing, and the reason they say, well, I'm lazy, I'm not disciplined, um, mm -hmm. I'm not really sure which stretches to do, it's because they don't know what to do. We're giving them an exact plan, exact step-by-step, -step, only 24 ranges of motion in a progression with an exact methodology to get there. Mm -hmm. Like how long to stretch, um, and, and how it works into your warm up, how it works into your workout. Um, trainers are saying, don't stretch before a workout, just do dynamic, then stretch afterwards. Here's a roller, go stretch. Mm -hmm. A roller is not stretching. It's a massage. Let me yeah. set the record straight. Yeah. They call it stretching. It's not, it's not like a rolling pin using dough. It doesn't make the muscle longer. Yeah. It just feels good. It's a massage. Yeah. So learning these rules is what we're teaching. And that's why we're having such a high rate of success because we've got it down. We've got the formula down to, to yes. all the details. But, but then what, what changes in my performance or in my results when I start to implement this? How do I notice the difference when I start to invest the time? Okay. that's also an issue. Yeah. You're going to immediately, if you spend time, we say that you're going to invest time in the building phase to get to the maintenance phase. Yeah. The building phase, you're going to put in somewhere between one and a hundred hours. Yeah. There's no way to avoid it. For some people who have more natural flexibility, it may be 10 hours of doing these ranges and then everything's open like when they're a kid. Hmm. It may take 50 hours. It may take 100 hours. For some of the people who are, who are really locked up, some of the Navy SEALs who are overtrained, some of the athletes, it may take more than 100 hours. That means if you do two hours a day, it's going to take you, what, 50 days. So that's two months. Yeah. If that's what it takes, that's what you have to do. It's more important than cardio. It's more important than continuing your workout. Mm -hmm. um, and, and you're going to feel a difference. Not only will you be pain free, you'll feel like you can put more effort into it because you're not worried. And, and I'll give you an example. The guy goes in and does bench press and every time he does it, his shoulder hurts. Mm -hmm. When you get rid of that pain, instead of thinking, ah, what, what can my shoulder take? Yeah. You're thinking now it feels great. I'm really going for it. I'm really going to push yeah. along with the more the fibers are open, the more fuel you can store. So you're going to do more yeah. reps. Now you're improving yeah. your strength. We have people that say, well, supposedly stretching inactivates muscle fiber. It doesn't. Here's the key. It's unlocking locked muscle fiber. Yeah. Then the second part of the stretch yeah. is waiting for a minute for blood flow. We call it the dead zone or the rest zone yeah. so that you can refuel the muscle. It brings in calcium, magnesium, which helps contraction and release of the muscle. Now it's starting to function. Instead of being locked here, not opening, now it's starting to slide. All these little sarcomere sections are starting to open. Now you have a full length muscle, more fuel, less pain, and you're off to the races. Yeah. Yeah. Thanks a lot for, for, for mentioning that. I think it's indeed the fuel and, and also we unlock um, the, these, these parts that we are normally not tapping into because they're just locked in tight and we can utilize right. the, the strength and the benefits and, uh, and the mass of it in, in our performance. Yes. 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 Um, when I'm in a difficult stretch or in a pain stretch close to this, like seven or, or eight, um, I often forget to breathe or actually also I lock up my body and my breathing because of it, because of the, the tension that I feel. Right. Um, can you elaborate on how to breathe during stretching and why breathing is important? Yeah. Stretching is a way to release tension physically. Yeah. But you can't. You can't remain hyper and talk with your friend or be on the telephone and, and trying to stretch out the muscle. You've got to calm down. Yeah. And this is where the mental aspects come in. I also, uh, just sorry, I dropped my microphone. Yeah. I also um, teach uh, meditation, relaxation techniques, as well as hypnotherapy. So we really get into the power of the mind and, and learning how to relax. When you learn how to relax, you're, con you're slowing down brainwave frequencies on an EG reading from 20 some cycles per second down to below 10 if you're doing a meditation or a relaxation. When you do that, you're able to control your immune system because you're not overtaxing it by being hyper and being um, for 16 hours a day, we're awake and we have our pedal to the metal in the car, you know, we're, we're, we're going full speed. When you calm down, your metabolism slows down, your immune system will boost and, and do what it, what it normally does. Blood will flow, white blood cells will go everywhere in the body that needs to repair. 
And by calming down, your, your muscles will, will release tension easier. So we tell people to get into a normal breathing uh, rhythm that they feel comfortable with or slow it down, take deeper <clears throat> breaths, slow it down, more oxygen to the muscles so that they can uh, get the fuel that they need, yeah. and the blood flow that they need. Yeah. So it's, a, it's something we teach at our seminars and, um, and, and also in our, uh, on our one-on-one sessions where we do Zoom sessions with, with clients. And I literally have some clients that we've tried to do hypnotherapy and they're just too hyper. So we get into the stretching and the relaxation and the breathing. And before you know it, they're learning to control their metabolism, learning to control this. Yeah. get them out of that hyper state yeah yeah because we're always in the push and state instead of in we talked about this before we started instead of just allowing things to happen and, and uh, relaxing into it yeah yeah 16 hours a day we're hyper most yeah. people and yeah. it's only at night when you finally start to calm down then you have to get up eight hours later and, and be hyper again for 16 yeah. hours so yeah, we teach no the meditation sense. we teach the relaxation so that people can learn to control their metabolism yeah. And even when there's, when people start to feel sick and say, and people say, well, I'm getting sick. And I say, whoa, stop. You're not getting sick. A sickness is trying to get you and you're allowing it. If you stay hyper, if you yeah. calm down, your immune system will kick it out. Literally. Very good point. Yeah. So we, we get into a lot more depth, especially with COVID now. Yeah. It's a, it's a, all it is, all COVID is, is a flu. Yeah. It's a very strong flu, but it's a flu nonetheless. Yeah. And we teach people how literally to calm down, let the immune system boost and kick out all the symptoms and the, and your body goes right back to normal. Yeah. We've done it. I, I want to get into the tension, also the mental tension in, in a little bit, but I have, I have some more stretching related questions. Um, but this is very interesting what you're saying. Uh, sure. Yeah. How, how important is uh, during the stretching routine that we also um, stretch the antagonists and, and of, of what we just stretched. Is that, is that an important part? Are you talking the antagonistic muscles? In other words, if you're stretching the hamstrings, yes. do we have to stretch the quads? For instance. There's some interesting theories out there and techniques out there that I disagree with. And for example, they say if you're stretching your, your hamstrings that you should be contracting your quads. I totally disagree with that. When you're stretching, you stretch, period. That's right. it. You have to work in the body you need to allow the muscles to relax. You have to, you have to use the mind to feel it. And the reason we stretch for two minutes, when we go up to a seven in pain, we stretch for two minutes, is to allow the brain time to interact with the muscles. If you do a 10 second stretch or a 30 second stretch, you're just starting the process and up and move on to something else. We go for two minutes, which is a long time. If no one's ever stretched for two minutes before, try it. Try and hold a position for two minutes and see what happens. Mm. Your muscles actually start to relax. Yeah. Then we take a rest. We get some blood in there. And, and you'll actually feel kind of like uh, coming out of that stretch. We call it the, the dead zone. And it's kind of a moany, groany type feeling. But a minute later, blood has filled in all those little gaps. Now you can stretch a little bit further, a little bit more. That's how we work on building our range of motion. Yeah. Uh, if we need to do trigger point, we teach how to do trigger point or to go to a trained instructor of ours that can do trigger point to help release it faster. It'll yeah. take you half the time if you go to one of our trained instructors. Yeah. Um, so no, you don't have to stretch the antagonist. You, you only need to stretch what you need for that workout. For yeah. example, if you're doing an upper body workout with weights, you don't need to stretch your lower body. Yeah. If you're doing running for, for a, a long distance run, you don't have to stretch your upper body. Although if you loosen up your shoulders because of the motion, then it's gonna help. But for instance, with regard to the back, if you do back bends, then there is an importance to compensate it with the other side, right? Yes, it, but that depends on, you have to understand the anatomy and how it works. The reason people have back problems most of the time is not because their back is overly tight, it's because mm -hmm. their hip flexors are too tight. Mm -hmm. Now, how does that work and what does that mean? If you look at someone from the side and you, and you look at their hips, if, if their quads are tight and hip flexors are tight, they're going to have what's called anterior pelvic tilt. Yeah. Here's the arch in the back. When the hips rock forward, because the hip flexors are tight, you have a natural arch in the back. When you get the hips and the hip flexors to release and come up straight, now you don't have as much arch. Yeah. So some people have a tight back, but a lot of it is because they have tight hip flexors on the front. Does from that make sense? Sitting. Yeah, from all the sitting. We sit yeah. way too much. Yeah. We sit when we drive. We sit at our computer. We sit yeah. at our desk. We sit when we eat. Humans sit too much. 
and we end up rocking our hips forward and, and we get what's called anterior pelvic tilt. Now, physiotherapists know what that term means, anterior pelvic tilt, but they don't know what to do for it. Mm -hmm. They kind of have a half stretch where they use one leg behind you, leaning against the wall, and then they tell you to flex your glute to push the hips forward. Not enough, not even close to enough. For us, you've got to be able to kneel down on the ground, sit on your heels, lie all the way back flat on the ground. I tried that. If you today. can't do that, yeah. if, you have, if you can't do that, you will have a back problem if you don't already. Yeah. So yes, you have to loosen up the hip flexors to neutralize the hips, but you also have to loosen up the back where you're holding too much arch. Yeah. So I, again, I again we could go into it for an, for an hour and give demos, but. Yeah, I had to use some pillows uh, for that one. Yeah. But that's um, okay. We want you to modify the stretch so you don't go past a seven in pain. Yeah. We don't expect everyone to lie back on their back. It's very seldom done until yeah. you're trained to do it. But yeah. if you lean back on the couch and yeah. that gets too easy, then you can lean back a little further onto yeah. five pillows and then four pillows, then three. Eventually you get to the ground. All the tension comes out of your low back because you've neutralized the hips and not rocked forward and locked anymore. Yeah, it's very interesting stuff. Very interesting stuff. As I, as I mentioned, Joe, I'm currently training for an Ironman race, and obviously strength and endurance are very important. Uh, they're critical for this. Um, I've heard, and we've talked about this previously shortly already, that, that the stretching, it unlocks the fibers that we are not using, um, and they're, they're locked in the tightness of our muscles. Uh, how important is stretching um, for strength gain and for endurance gain? Is there a relation? Absolutely. Again, if you don't have full range, you're limited in how much uh, fuel that you can store in the muscles for energy. Yeah. And you're also limited in when you do the marathon and you're taking a lot of short steps, mm -hmm. meaning you're running 60, 70 or more miles a week to get prepare for it. You're training your muscles to be short. If they're yeah. short, they're not going to stores much fuel. They're not going to be free to move. If you're, if they're not free to move, every step is going to be and antagonistically fighting. Yeah. If, if you can't pull your legs back because your hip flexors in the front are tight, now you're having to work twice as hard with your hamstrings and glutes, yeah. pull your leg back because you have tight tension in the front. Yeah. So, uh, and if your hamstrings and your glutes are loose, you can't open up your stride more because you have resistance in the back. Yeah. So your hip flexors, you can't, you can't get the full stride length that you need to open up if you're training yourself to be short with these short marathon steps. So, so is it important? It's absolutely essential. Yeah. And what I imagine that will do is that once we have this increased flexibility and this increased rate, ranks of motion also, and, and more availability of fibers for the performance, um, I imagine that actually it will be easier to do the same thing that we were doing before because we're using more. Is that correct? Absolutely. Yeah. Absolutely. Right on the, right on the target. Yes. Yeah. Uh, that I have to really look at. I'm actually discussing the, the training schedule for, for the coming period. So I'm, I need to really implement this uh, much more yeah. thoroughly than I was doing until now. But you've been a yeah, great inspiration sure. so far. So, so thanks for that. Uh, another question. The number one uh, ailment is tightness, as you've also said on your website. And uh, this is tightness in our muscles, in our tendons, in our ligaments. And I imagine that I'd like to add one. It's also the tightness in our thinking. Um, you talk a lot about symptoms such as migraine, restless leg syndrome, and the like. What are, our, how, what are your thoughts on the relation between our possible tightness in our thinking and the manifestation of tightness in the body? And what can we do to alleviate this? Do you have some thoughts on this? I'm sure you do. Yeah, sure. Um, you know, the, the mental parts of things, if you control the mind, you control the body. Yeah. If you're limited in your thinking, and, and let's say that you're training for a marathon and uh, like you are and, you're, and in the swimming portion of it, your shoulder is tight. You're, well, the doctor tells you it might be arthritis because you're now 39 years old mm -hmm. and uh, they tell you it might be bursitis in the joint. And so they're you know, doing these uh, E-stim, they're doing ultrasound, they're doing a bunch of different therapies on it. If you're locked into what the doctor's limits are, then you're not able to expand your physical capabilities because you're locked in mentally. Mm -hmm. So um, if you if you go out and do your 10 mile run in you know three weeks before your marathon, and 
you feel like, well, yeah, my hip hurts, my shoulders hurt, but I'm going to just power through it. Mm -hmm. Now you're limiting your improvement because of your mental limitations. So um, it, it's really a matter of being able to expand your knowledge, expanding your intuition. Uh, we talked a little bit about intuition. Yeah. It's important to understand. I have so many athletes that come to me and they say, well, I've been to six doctors. I've been to physiotherapists. I've been to acupuncture. I've been to chiropractors, all this stuff. And I say, what does it actually feel like? They go, well, it feels like it's tight. Mm -hmm. Bingo. Right there's the, right there's the problem. Yeah. You, your intuition is better than the medical knowledge out there because they don't understand yeah. what, what we're teaching is how to, how, we're teaching advanced training. Stretching is just the foundation. If you don't have a foundation, um, you, you, you're limited in your ultimate performance always. Mm -hmm. So um, again, you're right on target with understanding that expand your mind, understand that, that there's more to learn and uh, it's going to lead you to a bigger performance because you're going to free up some of these things that have locked you in. Yeah, yeah. And now we're, we're talking about it in the, in the realm of sports. But what about um, people with tension in their thinking in the way that how they perceive reality or how they perceive their options, you know? Do you also have experience that that results in physical manifestation of that tightness? Maybe it's yeah, not related yeah. to physical exercise at all, but just by, by means of, of the thinking. That's also what I was pointing at with the question. Right. Let's say, for example, someone is 60 years old. Yeah. And they know that they're their mother had a certain disease. They're kind of waiting around thinking, when are they going to get this disease? Hmm. That's a limitation. Yeah. Um, instead of working towards better health, they're trying to avoid the disease, which is always on their mind. Yeah, by, by, by that they so, focus on it. Right, and so if their hands start to hurt and get tired and tight, they think they have arthritis, the doctor confirms it because the doctors don't know what else to call it if your hands hurt. They'll call it carpal tunnel or, or, or arthritis. So they're noticing every day that their hands are, are sore. Yeah. If their hands are sore, and yet all they need to do literally is start stretching the fingers, and their arthritis goes away, which wasn't ever there in the first place. Yeah. So again, it's a matter of learning to unleash the physical tension by learning to unleash the physical, the, the mental limitations. Yeah. Does that help understand? Yeah, it does. And I, and I imagine... I mean, this is kind of a chicken and egg situation because what I would imagine is that the more we are able to relax also in our thinking and our perceptions of what's, what's happening around us, the more we're able to see things for what they are instead of what we want them to mean or, or how we interpret things. So it's, it's a bit, we need to be relaxed in order to do that. Otherwise we remain tense. Yes, and, and when we do the meditation, we do the, the calming of the body, allowing the metabolism to slow down, allowing the body to work more efficiently. Mm -hmm. um, it, learning to relax is, is an art yeah. and it's also a science. And you need, you know, when people are, I know a lot of people who, who listen to a 15 minute tape and think that they're doing a great job of meditating. Well, sometimes their mind never stops. They're, yes. they're always thinking about, oh, well, I got to finish this meditation so I can make these phone calls and I have to do this errand. I have to do this and that. They're not really allowing the body to calm down. They're not allowing their mind to calm down. Do you know the number one sleep problem? And I'm going to tell you a, a little secret here that the medical world and the athletic world don't know yet. Mm -hmm. It's not a chemical imbalance in the brain. And it's not, it, the medical world is, is doing, in the United States alone, they're doing $42 billion a year in research and in um, treatments for migraine headaches. Mm -hmm. And yet the number one thing that, that they need is to, re, is to release the pain and the tension from a couple of muscles in the back of the neck. We've done 100 cases of migraines, and we've gotten rid of virtually all of them within a couple of days. Mm -hmm. I'm talking 20 year migraines. Yeah. But also the tension that people are, are holding when they go to sleep. The number one reason people can't sleep is because they're stuck in the left brain. Yeah. Now, what does that mean? They're stuck in their analytical, yeah. uh, they're worried about things, they're worried about divorce yeah. and money and kids and, yeah. and uh, their to do list and all the things they have to do their errands. And they keep thinking about it and they say, well, I don't know how to, un I don't know how to escape that. No. The way that you do it is you have to go into the right brain, which is your imaginative, more your artistic. You're, you're using your imagination to create. When you can learn to go somewhere, like we create in our meditation, in our seminars, we create a, uh, what we call an ideal place of relaxation. 
where you can go to your island, you can go to your mountain cabin mm. and go there and you can be there so that you're using your imagination. Then you can start focusing on healing your body and on your goals and manifesting new realities. So instead of being stuck in the left brain and not being able to sleep and saying, well, I don't know how, then you do a sleep study and then they give you drugs and they, they yeah. have all these remedies, except number one problem is you have decided to think when you decide to worry, when you decide to think about um, your, your money situation and your problems and your to-do list and your high ambition goals, um, then you're not allowing yourself to calm down, go into the right brain and be at your cabin, be at your, on your beach alone, just relaxing in the sun. So it's a matter of learning how to escape the left brain to go into the right brain. We'll go into more in that uh, in, my, in my upcoming book and, and uh, additional seminars that we do. Yeah, it's amazing. I hope that in London we get to touch on this as well. Uh, Absolutely. Yeah, yeah. And I yeah, we're going to be coming to London. Sorry? In, in, we're going to be coming to London, it looks like May, May 20th. Yes. As, yes. Long as, as long as the travel restrictions are not restricting us, uh, it looks like May 20th will be our seminar finally in London. We've had to put it off because of the COVID. But um, we have a seminar seconds, coming up. Right? Three days. Um, yeah, for a three-day seminar. And then for people who want to get certified and teach what we, what we do, and help other people that will continue for four more days so it yeah. goes from march or uh, may 20th to the 26th i believe okay. we're having one in san diego in uh march march 18th to the 24th yeah. so uh, for anyone who's who, it's uh, we're on ultimatehumanperformance.com is our website I'll, I'll be making sure to put the link to the website uh under all the all the content definitely thank yeah. you thank you yes um, you studied, actually, we're talking about this, you studied the power of the mind, and you're also a master hypnotist. And as far as I'm aware, um, yeah, we attribute great importance to the power of visualization, right? This is, this is a very important part of what you're teaching and also part of your practice. Absolutely. We've talked about this already, about going to this um, imagined place, and by that, being able to leave your tension behind in this physical body and, and find the relaxation through our mind. Can you tell me more on your work with hypnosis and also the focus of the mind, especially with regard to visualization? Because I, I would, yeah, yes. very curious about this. Yeah, if we're not creating new habits, we're living old ones. Mm. I want that to sink in. If we're constantly creating new habits, creating positive habit development, PhD, you get PhD in your thinking, right? Mm -hmm. Positive habit development, otherwise you're living old ones. I'll give you an example how it applies in a sport. If, if you're a golfer and you're young and, you're, and you make it to the big time and you're in a big tournament and you happen to be hitting really well because you're really focused, you're really hungry, and then you realize there's, you're on the 15th hole, there's only three holes left and you're winning. And you start thinking, uh-oh, what if I miss this shot? Hmm. What, what, if I, what if I get distracted? Uh, what if I hit it in the pond? You know, in the water, if you're not f focusing and visualizing on, I'm going to hit it right down the middle. I'm going to, I'm going to sink this putt. I'm going to, uh, nothing else matters. I'm going to, I'm going to zone in and I'm going to find that exact perfect swing. Otherwise you're thinking, uh oh, what if I hit it in the water? What if I hit it out in the, in the out of bounds? You have to use the visualization that you create by creating habits, by meditating and visualizing winning the tournament, not hoping to get there. And once you get there, it's like, okay, well, I'm here, but uh oh, I didn't really focus on what I'm going to do when I get here. So I hope I don't screw up. Mm. You can't, you can't constantly say, I hope I don't screw up. I hope I don't miss the putt. I hope I don't hit it in the water. You've got to think I'm going to nail it. I'm going to nail it. I'm going to do better. I'm going to really focus. So again, yeah. when we, I, I, when we do hypnosis, kind of, yeah. yeah, no, sorry, please. When we do hypnosis, it's kind of a, a funny word because people really don't understand. They think it's that you give up control to someone else and they make you mm -hmm. do funny things like cluck like a chicken. Um, hypnosis, that's stage hypnosis where they do funny things. But when you're trying to do, trying to make a change in the way you think, what we're trying to do is create that vision that you want to work towards. And as long as you're working towards it, you're working away from other things. I'll give you another example. What's about focus? <clears throat> focus. I'll give you another example. If you're on a diet and you want to lose weight, if you're thinking, I can't eat that donut, I can't eat sugar, I can't eat those things. As long as you're thinking, I can't do that, it's kind of like, okay, well, don't think of a pink elephant. 
Yeah, you'll be thinking. You can't of it. not think of a pink elephant if you're thinking of a pink elephant. Yeah. What I say is, if you're walking down the street and you're you're you, and you smell the donuts from in front of the bakery store, and you look in, you think, well, I'm not going to eat it because I'm on a diet, but I like to smell it. Well, I'm going to go in and just you know look at one, but I'm not going to eat any. Mm -hmm. And then you end up taking a bite out and say, well, I'm not going to eat the whole thing. And then you end up eating three donuts. Yeah. It's better to when you when you start smelling the sugar in front of a bakery. Go across the street to the hardware store. Yeah. Right. <laughs> Go somewhere else. You can't not think of donuts. You have to think of something else. So we visualize towards what it is you're trying to think of. We don't want to think about, oh, I'm, I'm, I'm I weigh too much. Um, I'm unhealthy. You want to think about, I'm going to get healthier. I'm going to get thinner. I'm going to get uh, a better body. Whatever it is you're working towards, work towards it. Don't try and work away from something. Yeah. Desire is more important than discipline. Yeah. Desire towards goals is better than trying to be disciplined because discipline eventually wears off yeah. for most people. That's a good point. And it's, it's where focus goes, energy flows. And by, by shifting our focus in our visualization, there's no time to, to get stuck or to stay stuck in, in those concerns or our worries. And then the rest will follow. Yeah. Absolutely. Great point. Yeah. Yeah. It's kind of my mantra and it's really, I mean, it, it's so important. We really have to be conscious what we, what we spend our energy and time on because yeah, that, that's determined by our focus. And the, yes, absolutely. The visualization is an important tool in, uh, in this regard. Yeah. Absolutely. Uh, my, my second to last post Joe, was about uh, posture. And I have to say, I've learned really a lot with regard to posture and also with regard to how Actually, I'm in most cases negatively influencing my posture by, for instance, my desk work. I spend a lot of time behind my desk. Luckily, I have a, a standing sitting desk and I use that more and more and I bought a, a better chair and so I have some improvements. But still, um, because of this repetitive um, work, th there are things that we cannot fix by just merely fixing our posture. So one thing, what I, what I believe we talked about, my bicep tendonitis, um, I think it actually has to do with, with using my, my mouse. And actually, I got, a, I got a great tip. I now have like an anti-slip mouse mat um, okay. from Olivier, and that forces me to keep the mouse close to me because I've learned that actually I shouldn't go further than 20, 20 degrees radius. And what happens often is I go far away without the mouse mat. So there's one improvement there. But then still, um, I, I have this for years, this bicep tendonitis. Another thing that I've had for a long time is tension here. You mentioned about, about golfers. Um, I don't know what you call this muscle, but um, I imagine it's from maybe typing or, or some other rep repetitive movements. What tips, because I'd like to take the opportunity, I know about this stretch. Is there something else that I can do for the shoulder that really benefits it? And that other people yeah. can, because I'm not the only one who has this problem, who's sitting or spending a lot of time behind the desk. Yeah. Uh, there's multiple answers to the question because it's a multi-pronged uh, question. Yeah. So posture, if you can do all of our ranges of motion, your posture will be neutral and it will be perfect. Mm. If you try and create posture, like some techniques out there, there it's all about holding, holding your certain muscles tight so that you have a good posture. Yeah. That creates problems a lot of times because we're not supposed to, we don't want to focus on flexing muscles. We want to focus on relaxing the ones that are too Correct. tight. That's Alexander so, therapy. I don't, I don't know if you're familiar with it. It's really about Alexander therapy. This is really about relaxing the, yeah. And coming yeah. back to the natural but, state. Right. And there has to be the mental parts of the relaxation. There has to be the physical parts where mm -hmm. you have a standard for, for, uh, range of motion. So, um, to answer your question, when you're, I'm, I'll do a quick demo using the chair that I have. So I'm going to tilt the, the camera a little bit because this is a really important point that you're making. Um, if I have, I'm going to move my chair to the side here. Mm -hmm. When people are sitting in front of a desk, I'm going to tilt this down so you can see my hips. Yes. Okay. So when, when the concept is, your hips are a box of bone that sits on a ball and socket joint. Yeah. Okay. Your hips can rotate forward, mm -hmm. like when we're sitting, or it can rotate back or up where it's neutral. Yeah. Because we sit a lot, we create tight hip flexors 
that if we don't elongate those hip flexors, we're going to end up in anterior pelvic tilt. Yeah. And then we end up arching our back all day long just to compensate. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. So the key is not necessarily just to stretch your back over and over and over every day. It's to get these to release so your hips can come back here mm -hmm. and be neutral. Now your posture is neutral and you, it, your structure is supporting itself. Yeah. When we sit a lot, I'll show you on the chair here, if you can see that in the, in the camera. Yeah. Yeah, yeah. When I tell people, go ahead and sit on your sit in, sit in your chair and I want you to just be relaxed and let's talk. So they sit and they're very relaxed and there's no muscles being flexed. I say, now sit up and type me an email. Here's what they do. They roll their hips forward and they arch their back. Can you see that? Yeah. And then they do this. And they do that for six or eight hours a day. And I say, now sit back and relax again. And the hips come back and they take the tension off their hips, hip flexors and their back. I say, now sit up and type me an email again. So they do this. You see that? Yeah. That's what creates tight hip flexors and tack. Here's what you should do. When I say sit up and type me an email, you should pull the desk, pull a chair up like this, and now type relaxed instead of leaning up to type. Yeah. We're relaxed to type. And if you pull up the chair enough, your arms are going to be in a natural hanging state as opposed to holding them up all the time, Correct. which tightens this. Yeah. Now you also mentioned on your left arm, this muscle hurts. This is your brachioradialis. Whenever you yes. work your biceps, you're working the brachioradialis also because it's a pulling muscle. Yeah. So when you do this, the arm up and behind this one to open up your biceps, you're also going to open up the forearm, mm -hmm. the tennis elbow or the golfer's elbow. Yeah. Does that help? Yeah, a lot. And, and actually okay. both of them have been with me for, for a long time, for the, the, the tension. Yep. So basically the, the, the arms back is going to do good for both of them. Absolutely. It will. Yeah. It opens up the whole pulling muscle chain. Yeah. So it's not just the biceps that open, but you break yeah. your radialis attaches just above the elbow. So yeah. whenever you're pulling and if you, if you pull your sleeve up and, and, and do a pulling motion, you'll notice the bicep is flexed and the yes. break your radialis. And this one flexed. also, even when you grab the dumbbell way, to, way yeah. to open it is doing this one behind up on a chair first and add some pillows and your couch and your bed or whatever your countertop so that yeah. you can get to that stretch and you have to be in a position where you can relax for two minutes to allow the muscle to stretch yeah. and you do it over and over and over again but that's what we teach in our videos and our seminars etc yeah I, I wanted to touch upon the, the upcoming book thanks a lot to, by the way joe for for, for uh yeah for for all that you've shared so far uh, of course I'm, I'm really curious to, to read this book. So maybe you, you want to just share a little bit for the people what they can expect. Um, and also what I can expect because I'll definitely be ordering it as soon as it comes out. Okay. Uh, what, what can we expect and when can we expect the book to be published? We've talked about the I'm previous, the, I think this is interesting for, for everyone. Yeah, I'm hoping in the next few months we can finish it up. Uh, yeah. We're, yeah. We're, doing, we're in the almost final stages of it now. Uh, we still haven't picked the title yet, but it will refer to ultimatehumanperformance.com yeah. as our business. Yeah. Um, yeah. But one of the titles we're considering is Miraculous, because we've done thousands of cases that have proved to be miraculous. And the, the tagline will be the art, science, and zen of ultimate human performance. Hmm. So it involves a lot of the different parts of performance, uh, stretching being a, a major factor and a major key to it because that's the foundation of all movement so in every sport that you're in for every activity whether you're sitting knitting at home that's your main activity you have to keep the 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 hands and the carpal tunnel away you have to keep certain flexibility in your fingers in your wrists through the rest of your body and, and that's what we're teaching so um i we don't know the final title yet but yeah. it will be on my website ultimatehumanperformance.com yeah. and, and hopefully amazon and a few other uh, published areas yeah, uh, awesome. make it available. And so there's also going to be, you mentioned Zen as part of the subtitle. So there's going to be a part also uh, that goes into the mental element of it, not only physical. Yeah. Yeah. And, and again, it's the, the art, the science, and the Zen of ultimate human performance. The art is knowing how to move and how to mm -hmm. combine, you know, the, the, the different positions to, uh, to make it specific for your sport or whatever. That's the art. The yeah. science is the actual holding for two minutes, resting for one minute, yeah. uh, doing an exact progression. For example, a physical therapist may have, when they have a low back issue uh, client, then they'll do what's called a sit and reach test. Basically you sit, you reach for your toes. 
Yeah. That's their that's their lumbar flexion test. We have four levels of lumbar flexion. It has to be step by step. That's the science part of it. The Zen part is being able to learn how, as you touched on quite a bit today, learn how to let go, how mm -hmm. to how to relax, how to how to become one with your body so that you can maximize your performance. For example, if you give yourself only a half hour to stretch in the morning and, and you're reading your to-do list and you're trying to make some emails at the same time, you're still working. You're not relaxing. You're not stretching. But yet if you engage as you're sitting, leaning forward, you're engaging, thinking about what, am I, what does my low back feel like? Mm -hmm. It's starting to release. I feel the tension. It's starting to release. I'm going further. I'm leaning further and further. Your muscles, now you're, now you're engaged. Now you're at one with your body, allowing it to do your vision. And that is elongate the muscles, uh, reach a, a better range of motion. Yeah. So those are the parts of um, yeah, ultimate human performance. Very interesting. And, and I, I like that you touched upon the point that, and this is, I think, very true for many people, we have lost contact with our body, our ability to be our body and to feel what, what we're experiencing physically, because we're always in our head on the, like you said, in our left brain. Always. Yeah, very, very much so. We're, we're on the go all the time. And exactly. if you don't take your foot off the accelerator all day, eventually the engine's going to wear down. Yeah, and when so you've got to be able to reconnect, reconnect with nature, reconnect with calm, and the center. Moment. So yeah. that you can focus on, on, yeah, on better health. Yeah, amazing. Last question, Joe, and I like to I like to close with this question always, um, and it's this: What question uh, about stretching and let's say ultimate human performance didn't I ask during this talk, which I obviously should have asked because I just forgot about it. Is there an angle that you think, oh, this is important to address? Yeah, and this, this goes into where the book is going to cover a lot is in, in human performance, and that doesn't just mean athletics. Mm -hmm. It means in everyday life. And whether you're 80 years old and you have arthritis and you want to get rid of it and you want to live longer and be healthy, um, the missing link is flexibility to a standard mm -hmm. not just stretching not just going to a yoga class flexibility to a standard with a plan yeah. and and that's what we're trying to provide is look everybody can do this everybody hurts when marketing people ask me what area am i going to focus on am i going to focus on shoulders or migraine headaches or whatever i said no everybody hurts mm. well but you know, you you talk about migraines, you talk about shoulders. We can also fix plantar fasciitis or restless leg syndrome, which the medical world is still up in the air about. They don't even know if it's for real or not. We mm -hmm. know that the muscles are locked, the blood's not flowing. You got to keep moving in the middle of the night so that you get some blood flow in there. So the missing link in the medical world and athletic world is flexibility to a standard. Mm -hmm. When people finally realize that, their aches and pains are going to go away. Mm -hmm. So. And they're back at the fountain of youth, 17 years old. Yeah. Exactly. The fountain of youth. It's it's 60% being able to move yeah. to the ranges of motion you were when you were young. 20% nutrition, 20% learning con to control your metabolism through the mental processes of meditation, deep breathing, etc. Yeah. So fountain of youth is very real. People just have to learn how to access it. Joe, I, I, I want to thank you. It's been amazing. And I, I again, learned a lot. I will continue to do so, I'll study your material. Um, and I look forward to seeing you in London and to, uh, to do more together. Yeah, it's been amazing. Fantastic. You, you are an, uh, an A number one interviewer. You, you're, you really have a, a great ability to focus on the core issues of, of uh, the subject that you're on. And uh, I really appreciate it. This is a great opportunity for me uh, to get the word out and uh, you've done a great job. So thank you. Thank you for, for making the time and uh, I appreciate the feedback. I'll, I'll continue to, to do more of this. My pleasure yeah. and my best to all of your listeners and your watchers. Thank you. Be in touch. Have a great weekend. Thank you. You too. Bye, Joe.